Hey everybody, we got Mike back here and we're going to be talking more about night vision related things. Now we're going to talk about how to get it on your head and what all goes along with that. So this is, again, being that we're specific to night vision, this kind of series of podcasts, the whole helmet setup idea, you know, that that night vision. Uh, in this case, you can see behind uh, Mike, he's got his his dual tubes set up, the DTNVSs, and uh, we're, that's going to kind of be a centerpiece. But helmets, Mike, it's kind of, um, oh, it's not... It's not super complicated, but it is at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty basic concept, right? Like, it's a thing that goes on our head and, in theory, offers, offers us some level of protection. But it also does a whole lot of other stuff for us in regards to uh, supporting activities under night vision. Right. So right. there's and some I've, nuance to it. I've seen a lot of pictures of different people with their various helmets on, and, you know, they've always got the, the classic night vision up front, but... And there's all kinds of stuff going on all over the helmet. I mean, like, you can really kit these things out, and, um, yeah. I mean, to an incredible level. So we've got a few examples behind Mike here, and um, that's kind of what we're going to go into. So, Mike, first things first, I think you said you wanted to start kind of going from your skull outward. Yeah. Does, yeah. That, so, does that make sense? Yeah, um, and that's how I like to think about the the helmet system and, and getting the night vision kind of on your face or in front of your face um, and to function with it. So if we uh, start, you know, from, from our head and work our way out, uh, we address some pretty uh, important issues. And one is, um, you know, uh, like I want a nice stable platform. And there's times where I can kind of fudge that a little bit if I need something that I can stuff in a pocket. Um, and we won't put a too, too much emphasis on this, but in addition to a couple of helmets that we have back here, so I've got a, a bump helmet that's non-ballistic and a ballistic helmet over here. Um, I also have, this is a product from Cry Precision called the Nightcap. It's a, uh, you know, one offering of a concept, which is a, you know, rolled up, uh, easy to, to pack away, item that allows me to wear night vision on my head without all the the bulk and weight of a traditional helmet yeah it's just like a soft mesh with yep. some straps and things like that to fit um, it to your head and a pad on the front yeah a little bit of appropriately positioned padding um, and then i've got the night vision plate uh, that my mount clips into um, and i like to have this if i'm uh you know not planning to do a lot of night vision stuff, but I want to have night vision as a capability. I can stuff it down in a pack with either a PVS-14 um, or even a set of, uh, you know, dual tube night vision, uh, my, my mount. Um, and now I've got a really, you know, huge capability for not a lot of weight. Um, there's other you know, options out there besides Cry. When I purchased this, it was one of the, the best options available. Uh, and since then, other companies have come out with um, alternatives. Yeah. Now, that being said, like, in addition to being lighter weight and lower bulk, um, it doesn't have, like, a great pad system. It doesn't have a great suspension system. Um, and ultimately, I've got, you know, a hard uh, fixture on soft material. So there's a little bit of play in there and when we look at like helmets we kind of want to try and avoid that like right. we want to minimize movement on our head as much as possible um, through having a good suspension system and a good pad set so um, if we look at this team windy ballistic helmet right here um, i've got uh, a pretty fair complement of pads in here uh, that are Velcroed in place, and they really let me kind of tailor the fit to my skull, right? So right. Usually, uh, when you get these, they come with multiple pads that aren't even installed yet. You can actually yeah. And in like fact, like I've out, got right? uh, the pad set from uh, the leftovers that I didn't use from from this helmet uh, here. I don't remember exactly how many, but yeah, you know, it's more than a dozen extra pads um, that we can use to fit the helmet to our head. So we want to make sure that we get a helmet that's sized correctly. We want to follow the manufacturer's uh, sizing recommendations. And then we want to pick a helmet um, kind of regardless. We'll get into ballistic and non-ballistic here in a minute. But we want to pick a helmet um, that you know has a good pad set and suspension 
to mm-hmm. it so that the helmet will sit and stay in position on our head and not you know, bounce around and move a lot as we're doing activity. When you say suspension, just to kind of clarify that, you're referring to the, I mean, that's the straps and things like that that actually hold the helmet on your head, right? Yep. So um, like in this helmet, uh, I've got kind of a, a combination suspension system. So I have what you would normally, uh, you know, associate with a helmet system as this chin strap. And I've got um, a couple of anchor points up here kind of towards the front of my face and then a couple of anchor points back here uh, that would be closer to like the occiput, the back of my head. Uh, But I also had the BOA system, um, and that's basically like a ratchet and cable system that tightens down around, uh, circumferentially around my my skull. Um, and so with this setup, if I've got good pads, uh, or good pad setup and that BOA, the, the chin strap is kind of, um, like, you know, belt and suspenders, right? Cause I can really get the helmet cinched down with the BOA system. And if I don't have the uh, chin strap fastened, that helmet's still pretty secure. Yeah. Um, so the chin strap is just an extra, extra layer to make sure that the helmet doesn't slip off if, if things get, um, you know, a little, a little crazy, but, um, the, so to me, like that is a, a great system that I really like. Um, now there's other systems out there. Uh, I have used a uh, number over the years. And the, the thing that I look for is a, a good amount of adjustability. Okay. Um, I prefer webbing versus just straight cloth. Like some of the older Mitch helmets had like, it, it almost felt like, um, like a heavy t-shirt cloth material hmm. uh, and they just wouldn't stay positioned. So like you'd cinch them down uh, and they would loosen up uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and the first opportunity that I had to replace them with a little bit nicer webbing, uh, you know, suspension type system, I did that and, and it just works a little bit better. So do you, f- do you find it's the case? I know I've had this issue in, uh, in my past because I have a strange shaped head <laughs> that different brands of helmet manufacturers have a slightly different fit. Like when I looked for a motorcycle helmet, I remember a long time ago, I, I looked around and, and there were different people who would say, oh, well, this motorcycle helmet brand tends to fit their helmets to more of like an ovular shaped head, whereas mm-hmm. this motorcycle helmet brand or maybe this particular model within their lineup is more for like a round shaped head or something. Does that really happen much with helmets or since they're so... I mean, customizable with the padding and things like that. Do, do they just kind of, it, it doesn't really matter which brand you go with as far as your head shape. Yeah. So some of them, um, I, I would say like some manufacturers have little bits of nuance, but a lot of them, um, like this is a, another, uh, team Wendy helmet and it's a bump style helmet. And you'll notice like, even though it's not ballistic, it has the same pad set. So I can kind of fill those nooks and crannies. Mm-hmm. Um, now some of them have more of like a formed, uh, plastic suspension set, um, that pads go onto. And I feel like that's a little more restrictive, um, to where I can't tailor the shape of the helmet, uh, interior as much to my head because they're instead of it being a shell that I'm adding pads to, it's an insert that I'm adding pads to. And there's a little bit less flexibility there. Uh, I, I I don't know what drives that, I I guess, you know, uh, design goals with trying to make the helmet suspension better. But to me, um, I would almost rather like have just a good solid shell and let me make the, uh, the fit work perfectly through adding, uh, you know, pads in just the right places. Okay. But I think you will see some of that nuance. Um, and then shell, um, like shape, uh, can change and shift a little bit. So sometimes you'll, you'll have a helmet that'll come down your neck just a little bit more. Uh, you may have a, a helmet that's a little bit wider, uh, I guess, you know, right over the ears, th- those sorts of things. The Some benef- of them cut up high, too, like above yep. your ears and stuff. Um, so, like, the high-cut ones that uh, may uh, give you a little bit more space for, like, over-the-ear type ear protection, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Um, so, like, most of these modern helmets are, are you know, higher cut than the Mitch helmet, the original, uh, like, 2000 series that had, 
you know, uh, ear coverage. Oh, um, they kind of look like the helmets from Spaceballs or Star Wars. Yeah, maybe not quite that bad, but but <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, they were pretty popular in the early two thousands, and they had full coverage where you would, you could squeeze ear pro up under that mm. uh, and then they had like a, a half uh, high cut and then a full high cut uh, so like the 2000 2001 and 2002 series and um, now most helmets are, are you know have those cutouts for ear pro but they can vary as to how high it's cut mm. Mm. Uh, so like ops core i think has a couple of different sizes team windy has basically one size uh you know cutouts they have different sizes like medium, large, extra large. Uh, but there's little variations like that from manufacturer to manufacturer. If you get an opportunity to try on different helmets, I would encourage you to. Uh, it's kind of like other stuff in night vision where uh, helmets are can be pretty expensive and it's hard to find a place that has a lot of variety in stock to yeah, try on. It is. Uh, luckily, generally speaking, with pads, you can make you know the helmet fit pretty well as long as you get the you know at, at least it sized correctly uh, by following their recommendations but i will say like i have a couple of different mitch helmets um, i've worn an ops core helmet uh, for you know a short period of time um, i've got an airframe helmet uh, and i've got a couple different team windy helmets and each of them so like i like this is a newer team windy helmet and i have one of the older ones um, and each one of them fits just a little bit different, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, luckily with a, a good pad and suspension set, I can generally get a pretty good fit on all of them as long as, you know, I have the pieces and parts yep. necessary to make that happen. Um, and that's what we're looking for is we want really good stability on our head. So um, I have definitely seen students come in that maybe by no fault of their own, you know, they're issued a helmet that – doesn't have a great suspension and pad system to it or maybe they're issued a helmet that's too big because it's all we have left in the you know arms room to offer them uh or, or their agency or organization has to offer to them yeah. and the helmet is just you know flopping all over the place and it doesn't that ruins everything it does it does because now we can't keep the night vision in front of our face and we're just you know, struggling to be able to see, much less do any of the other skills that we're trying to do under nods. It's there's so many things with night vision where, you know, <clears throat> I, I'm totally the kind of person where if I can save money, I'm gonna do it at at any opportunity. But you know, and I get how this this philosophy can creep into just being uber expensive. But it's like, all right, the night vision is gonna be expensive itself. The stuff you're gonna stick on your helmet, the mount. I mean, all these things that we're about to get into here. And so if you don't have the foundation for it all to go on to and work properly with your I mean, body and eyes and all that stuff, you're going to be miserable to the point that why did you even spend the money on all the other stuff in the first place? You know, I think that yeah. helmet is just so it's so integral. What um, how about, though, like speaking of, you know, differences in cost and stuff like that, we've mentioned the term ballistic and then bump helmet or non-ballistic, kind of two uh, or one in the same, if you will. Uh, we have <coughs> examples here. So bump helmet right between Mike and I in the middle, and then he's also referenced his ballistic helmet thus far. Um, what do we got going on there, Mike? Where's the practicality for, you know, uh, Joe and Jane citizen, private citizen, all that stuff versus, like, no LE? Yeah, so... Uh, we'll start with the, the non-ballistic and kind of move up in, in price point, right? So um, non-ballistic, as the term may imply, it offers me no ballistic protection. But it does offer me bump protection, and it offers me the benefit of being able to mount the night vision to my head. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Solidly. Solidly. Um, and I would say that unless you really need ballistic protection like you're going to get shot like you like Let's like you're you're planning to i you know function in an environment where there's a high likelihood of you being shot at if you're just starting out in night vision i would rather you invest the money in a good quality non-ballistic helmet that has a good suspension system uh good pad set that sort of thing so that if you think like percentages a greater percentage of your money is going into the suspension system mm -hmm. than like 
a ballistic helmet that's a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars more than this non-ballistic helmet and all the money went into making the ballistic shell and the cost cutting or the savings was put into the suspension right right because so. if you're looking at same <coughs> brand so like yep. team wendy is just the one getting used here a lot because that's what we have right on hand but um you know if you look at same brand team wendy bump helmet versus team wendy ballistic helmet quite a jump up in price so you can't jump in price you can't compare apples to oranges is what you're getting at where you're like okay well here's xyz's bump helmet and then oh look at this i found a ballistic helmet that's only a teensy bit more than my it's from a different brand entirely because then that's where you're like hey that's we can't make that comparison like you said yeah so uh understand that like this helmet here has a good solid non-ballistic shell that offers me you know some bump protection uh, so i don't you know smack my head getting out of a vehicle i did uh, just experience that <laughs> the other day I went, yeah a buddy of mine went through a tremendous pothole in the truck and i slammed my head against the roof but i was wearing a bump helmet so i was fine yep and and helmets are good you know they protect our head um and with that a lot of the emphasis and money has gone into a good solid suspension system you know versus that like hey i'm going to save a bit of money on a ballistic helmet that's maybe not as nice as this team windy ballistic helmet and i don't have a great suspension system yeah, but, but it's i got that ballistic protection that i may not ever actually have to use because most of my time is going to be spent on the range you know, and, shooting paper and when we talk about ballistic helmets now i guess i don't know if i can speak for all ballistic helmets but it seems like the majority of them it's not like you're going to take a 762 round to the dome and have it just kind of like glance off and uh, right or? correct so the the majority of helmets out there that are ballistic are as they stand if you were to look at them like this they're they're 3a rated so they're rated for uh, pistol rounds and then they may have a secondary rating for fragmentation not all of them are, are necessarily put through that testing for fragmentation but they're not explicitly they're not rated um, for rifle rounds now there are uh, some placards that you can get for certain helmets that will add rifle level protection um, and there are helmets that are pistol rated that have defeated uh, rifle rounds mm. but that doesn't just because they were successful in defeating a rifle round doesn't mean that it's rated for that and it doesn't mean could have been um, the angle yeah could have been yeah so yeah. you know it may not have been uh, head on um, it also you know may have been at a distance where the velocity of the projectile was low enough that the the helmet was able to defeat it so like this helmet is a 3a helmet that's pretty much industry standard um so that that is pistol rounds not rifle rounds um and you know like it's it's good to have ballistic protection i just i hate to see people focus on like hey i want a helmet that will support me to do night vision stuff and then they think like, man, I got to have that ballistic protection, but I'm going to buy a helmet that maybe doesn't fit me well because I'm buying it secondhand or it doesn't have a great suspension system. So it doesn't fit really well. Mm -hmm. And then we spend a bunch of money on night vision and it doesn't stay in front of our eye. And it's kind of the experience is, you know, subpar. Right. So um, I would say either buy one, require one, save up and get a nice ballistic helmet that comes with a really good suspension system. Or accept the fact that we're going to have to get a bump helmet, or maybe the bump helmet is more appropriate for your use because you don't need to worry about ballistic threats. And we can save a little bit of money, still have a good suspension system, but also we don't have all the added added weight, right? I'm glad you mentioned so, that. So um, this helmet is substantially, you know, pointing to the non-ballistic helmet, is substantially lighter than this ballistic helmet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a reality that the material necessary to stop projectiles is going to weigh more than the material that is necessary to protect me from, you know, bumping my head if I'm, uh, you know, crawling out of vehicles or yeah. doing you know, rope work or something like that. The it, it is impressive the advancements they've made in ballistic helmets. Some of the very, very new ones are quite light when you, like all things considered. Yeah. But I, I, I got to say, you know, you got ultralight hunters, you got people who are really into lightweight <laughs> kit that they put on their bodies and things like that. They're... I myself am fine in some ways. Like, okay, I don't have the lightest weight toothbrush in my hunting kit. I don't have whatever it is that's super <laughs> ultra titanium skeletonized, this, that, or the other thing. If it's going on my, like, main body, but when it goes on your head, 
Oh man, that yeah. it, it the extra little bits of weight just add up, and it can be punishing over time. So that I started out, it was a nice one. Granted, I started out with a ballistic helmet because I'm like, ex- I was that person who was like, oh yeah, I might get shot. You yeah, know? and then <laughs> I still have it because it's it fits me great and all that. But I fairly quickly afterwards, I was like, all right, I got to get a bump helmet for you know all this other stuff that I'm doing, just going outside and just kind of goofing around or something. And like, the, yeah, the ballistic helmet is it's getting a little heavy. Yeah, it's definitely uh, a you know a bit of a relief to be able to use a non ballistic helmet. And you got to think like we're just talking about the helmet and its pad and suspension system. Uh, we haven't talked about the weight of the night vision. We haven't talked about any of the extra accessories that go on it. So if we can keep that base weight down uh, by going, you know, to a non-ballistic helmet, uh, you know, there is some advantage there. The other thing is with a most um, ballistic helmets, you don't have these nice ventilation ports here. So if it's the summer and you're uh, sweating and, you know, getting pretty active, it's kind of nice to have that little bit of ventilation. Uh, the cry airframe has uh, some ventilation built into it. You know, it's a two-piece design, but um, you know most ballistic helmets don't don't have that that you know it's a one continuous piece uh, in the shell, and and so you don't get that that advantage. So there definitely are some advantages to the to the bump helmet, and um, you know expense, weight, uh, and then ventilation are are the key ones. Mm-hmm. So those definitely are some things to be considered when you're making your purchasing decision. Seems to me, Mike, like just about every helmet you get now, talking more about the accessories and things on the outside, comes with one of these Wilcox mounts on the front of it. It, it, you know, again, in just trying to seek out the right helmet, you know, if you find things that are secondhand or they're cheaper because they're an older design or something mm-hmm. like that, like there are other sort of face plates. I don't even know if that's the right word or bases for the night vision that I've seen before, but yep. that's kind of outdated. This is this is something that you want to look for with. Uh, a modern setup if you're going to be getting semi-modern night vision and mounts and things like that, right? Yeah, and so um, really great point and a uh, you know good thing to touch on. There are a number of options out there. The good thing is that now night vision is so popular and common and that you can readily find helmets that have those mounts integrated into them. Uh, like when I got my first, um, like, you know, good quality ballistic helmet. It didn't come even drilled for a mount. And unfortunately, like I had to either choose buy a new helmet or drill a hole uh, to put a night vision mount onto it. So like this is a, an older, it's a still a good quality mount, but this is an older mount for a Mitch helmet. And it has space for one bolt to hold it onto the helmet. More modern ones will use either a three or four hole design. So like uh, this is a three hole design. This in the, the bump helmet is basically molded in with an aluminum insert, uh, which is a, a really key feature. We want those engagement surfaces to be uh, very, very tight tolerances. And ideally we want them to be aluminum on aluminum instead of aluminum on plastic. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> even with this bump helmet, you'll see we've got a Wilcox. So we know, you know, it's a, a known entity. It's not kind of a knockoff, uh, no name brand. Um, and so it, in theory, it should be, you know, built with fairly tight tolerances and it's an aluminum insert as opposed to that assembly be being molded into place yeah. where when I go to, you know, put like this G24 mount on, it's engaging aluminum to aluminum instead of aluminum into polymer or plastic where yeah. there's the potential is that it would, would break free. And then when you look at the ballistic one, this one came from the factory, uh, drilled, uh, you know, so they, they did it and they certify it and it's, it's been tested with those holes, uh, there. And then the plate is already installed. We've got, you know, a polymer shroud with a Wilcox aluminum insert in there. Um, I generally try to stick with either Wilcox or ops core. There are others out there that I'm sure work fine. Those are the two that, that I'm comfortable using. So like the nightcap here has a, an ops core, uh, aluminum plate to it. And we want that to be a really solid lockup. We're, you may notice a theme, like we're trying to minimize play in the system. Yeah. Right. And so if I buy, like I have bought units of these that were, um, not ops core Wilcox and, 
I've had trouble having some of my mounts fit into them. They just wouldn't lock, uh, you know, because they were dimensionally off. Or once they locked in, they had a lot of slop in them. And so I want to try and avoid uh, as much of that movement as possible by using parts that are built to spec with, you know, pretty good tolerances, um, and they're attached to the helmet, you know, fixtured to the helmet well. So mm-hmm. uh, we accomplished that. And, and luckily, you know, nowadays that's that's pretty easy uh, to do. There's also other accessories, like you can get, you know, action camera mounts and things like that, headlamp mounts sure. uh, that'll plug into there. So they're super common on, you know, modern helmets. It's um, become like the helmet, well, sometimes helmets have Picatinny rail on it, but it's sort of <laughs> yeah. like that it's, as well. It's, yeah, very, very similar concept that it's pretty much an industry standard and some people execute it better than others. Sure, so. sure. Do we, is the next natural thing then to go on to our night vision, mounting it to the helmet, you know, being that that's such a yeah, such a focus I, of today's I uh, think of that, our series here? I think that's a, a good direction to go. So uh, as I mentioned before, like this is a, a Wilcox G24 uh, mount. Um, it's kind of an industry standard at this point. There are others out there. Um, there is one that I'm interested in trying out by Kadex Defense uh, that may be like the the next, you know, uh, gold standard option. Wow. But the G24 has worked really well for, for many, many years. Um, it's a, an improvement over the old GI uh, mounts and, and it, you know, it just gets the job done and um, they they are somewhat expensive. Yes. You know, I mean, they're, they're a little bit of an investment, but when you compare them to some of the, the stuff that we've had in the past, uh, they're a, a pretty solid upgrade, and to me, they're worth the money. What about the, uh, what's the G22? I uh, saw that recently. Um, there's or there's a G20, there's other numbers. There are, there are. So there's a variety of different options. So like Wilcox makes... Um, some that have uh, break free and and ones that won't break free. So like, uh, if I apply a certain amount of force, this thing will, will pop off. That sort of thing. There's ones that have longer arms. And if I remember correctly, the G24 used to have a shorter um, adjustment range here, and they extended of- it and kind of uh, you know obsoleted one of their one of their other models. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they have some direct mounts. So whereas like this one, I can pop out from the plate. Um, you can get some that basically this part bolts directly to the helmet. Um, and then you, you know, basically eliminate one joint in there, you know, one, uh, you know, connection point. Um, oh, and yeah. so the, the mount stays permanently attached to the helmet. It wouldn't, and you, it wouldn't break free though, right? What's the what's the break free thing? What's what's that all about? Why would I want my night vision to break off my helmet? Uh, so that if you like slammed into something, um, the the mount would you know pop loose and basically be able to be reset instead of the failure point being like the junction between your night vision, uh, the the dovetail and the body. So like I'd rather the mount break free and be able to reset it so nothing's yeah. damaged versus like the housing uh, fail um, where, okay. you know, like this bridge would, would break. Temporary um, annoyance versus really expensive failure. Yep. Okay. And actually, I think this must be one of my old mounts. So this is actually a G22 that doesn't have, because I was like, where's the, the lever for the, uh, so there's a selector on the G24 that allows me to choose either locked in or that that break free uh setting Mm. um so uh this is one of my old mounts um not one of my work mounts and um and it's a a g22 it doesn't have that uh that break free setting uh but it does have a little bit longer extension i picked it up where i had some legacy g24s that didn't have that extra uh, range of motion to push the goggle further off of your face Um, because what i was running into is I would have a gas mask on and my helmet on and I'd flip my nods down and the nods were basically pressed up against the the shield of the gas mask. And I needed that little bit of extra, you know, travel to get them uh, into position, you know, out further in front of my face. And it's my understanding that the newer G24s have that extra length that just they were like, hey, um, 
uh, more people are asking for it. Let's just build one model, and it has all the features of the G24 with a little bit of extra travel. I believe that is is accurate. Um, when I looked at some newer G24 mounts, it looked like that dimension was the same. Yeah. So. And what you're referring to when you're talking about travel is that these mounts have inherent adjustability in them because we <clears throat> all have different shaped faces, different eye positions, different size and shaped helmets that we're going to be putting these mounts onto so they they offer a good bit of adjustability up down forward away from your face back towards your face they have some tilt in them uh, this is a really key element once you've had your helmet properly fitted to when you put your night vision on getting your night vision properly fitted so that when you flip it down over your face it's in the right spot and you can see through it the right way yeah and not just that but there is no like industry standard and i don't know how you would make one of where this plate mounts onto the helmet. Well, so yeah. like on some helmets, it might be a couple of millimeters higher than others. And so you need that adjustment range in the mounting system uh, so that we can get it optimized. And also like not everybody wears the helmet exactly in the same position on the head. Mm -hmm. Like some people may allow the helmet to ride a little bit further back. Some people may have the brim a little bit further forward. Um, and this allows us to get the, the night vision perfectly you know, centered over our eyes um, and at the correct angle so that we're not looking through the, the optic at an angle. Uh, we're looking through the perfect center of the optic as yep. much as possible. It's just like in the eye relief set on your rifle scope when you mount it up on your, yep. uh, on your gun. So, um, yeah, so all this stuff helps get the night vision in the right spot. It's, a, it's definitely an area, the junction between your expensive, nice night vision and your nice helmet that you fit so well to your head. It's definitely an area where you don't want to cheap out. Even though literally just this morning, I was looking around at knockoff versions of the Wilcox and trying to cheap out, and I just couldn't do it. And I, yeah, so. I, I have, I, I, you know, I've heard a number of people talk about trying those out, and um, most of the responses seem to be positive. Um, I can't bring myself to do it because I feel like uh, I've got this really expensive piece of, you know, optical equipment hanging from this thing that isn't a known quantity when I you know, see the Wilcox name on there, I, I feel a little more confident uh, yeah. that I have $10,000 hanging off of uh, that piece <laughs> of, you know, or that, you know, uh, assembly of aluminum. Oh, um, man. With, with that in Why mind. Why get into this stuff? Yeah, <laughs> right? Uh, with that in mind, um, you know, we do ultimately have a big chunk of change hanging off of, you know, this assembly. Um, and so it's nice to have uh, a little... A little backup, you know, safety system to it, uh, and so that brings us to uh, lanyards and tethers. So um, you'll notice uh, if you're watching the video, um, I've got two bungee cords here. Those serve a couple of different functions. Um, the the kind of biggest one, or or I would say probably the biggest one, is that it retains the goggles if something were to happen where the goggle pops out of the mount or the mount pops off of the helmet. Okay, so it keeps the goggle from basically, you know, falling on the floor and, and potentially causing any damage. The other thing, and um, it's a pretty nice advancement. Uh, we used to have tethers that weren't, uh, you know, elastic material like this. Oh. They were basically just um, almost like my, my key fob where uh, there was a little bit of tension on it, but it really didn't accomplish anything. I, I actually think I have one of the old Wilcox ones here. And so this would attach as a part of the mounting assembly. And then it had just a little cable that would come out and you could clip it onto the goggle. And so yeah. if the goggle fell off, it would basically dangle in front of your face and not smash against the ground. The nice thing about the bungees is they hold kind of constant tension on the assembly. So even though this is a really solid plate, uh, mounted to this helmet, uh, you know, nice and fixtured on there. And then I've got, uh, you know, a, a top of the line mounting system to attach the night vision uh, to. There's still a little bit of play in there. Oh, yeah. Um, and so by putting a set of bungees on there and having a good bit of tension on it, it holds the, that like a constant amount of tension against that night vision housing so that there isn't all that slop. It less is noticeable. Bounce. Yeah, sure less that's bounce. Nice in the vehicle. And so uh, these are great for making sure that we don't dump our goggles by accident or they don't get, you know, knocked off the helmet. But it also holds that tension so that they're consistently in one spot in front of our face. Yeah. And it can be a little bit difficult to set up like a PVS-14 
uh, uh, you know, a monocular style setup so that you have this like equal and opposing tension coming from either side. Um, on dual tubes, we basically just put a set of split rings, uh, one on each side. And so you have like this equal pressure on either side of the bridge um, and it's pulling the goggle, you know, back against uh, this mounting assembly. Um, and it's just a, a pretty nice upgrade that, you know, 15 years ago, uh, dudes were, uh, you know, kind of rigging these up, you know, in the team room. And now they kind of come standard on most helmets. They do, yeah. Came so, with my helmet. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we got a lot of weight hanging out of the front of this thing. And some people uh, will bring up the case that it's good to counter counterbalance that weight. And they'll throw a counterweight on the back of their helmet. So this is where now we're going to start getting into some of the other items that you see. One of the very obvious ones, of course, being the ear pro. That's yeah. somewhat self-explanatory. We're going to be shooting guns, so you know it's, it, it's going to get loud. But this one on the back, you'll sometimes see uh, people just literally just sticking weights onto the back of their helmet. Yep. And um, it sounds so funny when you say it that way, <laughs> even though like a lot of people do it. I even do it. Um, sometimes it's a battery pack which can be mm -hmm. an external battery pack that plugs into your night vision and powers them for longer periods of time or plugs into other things, carries batteries. Um, something to add weight to the back to balance it out front to back. What do you think about that, Mike? I know you have thoughts on it. <laughs> yeah, I'm generally not a fan of that uh, concept. I understand what it comes from. You know, we're basically trying to make it so that the distribution of weight is similar from front to back so that I don't constantly have to fire all these muscles in the back of my neck in order to basically keep my chin up, yeah. right? Um, otherwise, I've got all this weight up front, and it's trying to pull my, my chin or my face down, and so I'm constantly having to fire these muscles in the back of my neck to, to keep my, my, you know, eyes up and looking forward. Um I have, you know, run PVS 14s. I've run a whole host of dual tubes. I've managed to avoid needing uh, a counterweight. I, I know some people swear by them and maybe it's just, you know, I've worn helmets long enough that I've gotten accustomed to it. I will say when I have worn uh, panos, uh, you know, the, the quad tubes, like those are heavy enough that I really started to notice a little after spending eight hours, 10 hours in them, that I started to notice the weight a bit more. And I was like, ah, eh, maybe there's an argument for a little bit of counterweight. Yeah. Um, with my 31s or the DTMVSs, it, to me, it's not enough weight to, to justify it. But um, I'm also a little bit different in the sense that I've been wearing this stuff long enough that I think I've got a little bit of, you know, muscular development and, and acclimation to, to wearing, you know, helmets and having that, that weight on the front of my face. And so I, I'm okay with it, but I don't like disparage people that want to have, you know, some yeah. counter counterweight on their helmets. Thanks. <laughs> Cause I, I, I do have it on mine. Yeah. Um, ideally I would say, you know, try and make that weight as useful as possible. Right. Right. So Sometimes they come in all different weight, uh, sizes and shapes. Like, this is a big counterbalance yeah. uh, counterweight setup on this bump helmet here, whereas that one that you brought out is, is pretty small. This is a smaller one that I believe came from Team Wendy. Um, I want to say it was in the, the kit of stuff that uh, came with this helmet when I started working here. And it is, you know, basic Velcro pouch with, you know, three lead weights in it. And um, I can adjust how much weight that I want to use by just, you know, using three or fewer. Um, that one is a, a good bit bigger. And there's other options out there. So like you mentioned, you could use battery packs. You could even just use one of these enclosures and then store something that's maybe more useful than just simply, you know, like plastic dipped lead. Yeah. Right. Um, so I know that if I'm running night vision, I got a lot of stuff on me that needs batteries. And so even if it's not a battery pack that pipes energy directly into the night vision, maybe it's just an assortment of extra batteries that puts a little bit of weight on the back of my helmet, but it's also useful. Right. Uh, you know, it, it's something that I'm going to probably end up needing at some point. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, and, but to me, like my goal is to 
try and minimize extra weight on my helmet whenever I can. But I do understand that balancing that weight out does give you a little bit added layer of comfort, particularly, you know, hour five, six, seven, eight and on. Yeah, I don't have nearly as much experience as you do with it, but I, I, it seems to me, and it could be entirely placebo, that it does add a little bit of comfort. But I still totally understand the counter argument where, you know, I, one day in the office you put it so eloquently, it was just like basically I'm adding, you are adding useless weight to your helmet, technically, if you yeah. look at your helmet as an entire piece System. instead of front to back. And this stuff, like adding weight to your head, will, I mean, ask anybody who's, you know, done this for a long time mike for example or people have been in the service and you know and, and they're and they're using this stuff a lot like their necks get kind of trashed over time yeah. and so adding useless weight even if you're doing it for the sake of counterbalancing to some of these guys it might just be like no dude just i i want whatever i just want the lightest thing possible you know or if i am an add weight like you said make it useful weight like batteries or something like that even then i suppose maybe they wouldn't be opposed to just carrying batteries elsewhere on their body but um you know if it is going to add some level of comfort maybe but uh but yeah it's i don't know i found a pretty inexpensive counterweight mm -hmm. setup um i i just got it on amazon and i tried it out you know so it doesn't yeah. that's one thing at least in night vision where it doesn't have to be insanely expensive yeah yeah which is nice and so it is a you know it's a reasonable thing uh, that i think people can try uh, it's just not it's something that I have stayed away from, but I will tell you, using quad tubes, I was like, man, I wish I had one of those in my gear bag, mm. uh, just to kind of balance things out. I wish I could say I felt bad for you <laughs> and your neck pain, but I don't at all because I've never even seen a set of quad tubes in person. Uh. Um, how about uh, how about other stuff just around the outside of a helmet, Mike? Because I mean, these are pretty. I would say by all uh, Instagram standards, these are pretty clean helmets. They don't have. Like there's helmet covers, mm -hmm. which I always thought was just for basically, you know, guys who like to put a lot of decals on their cars and stuff. Like <laughs> there's helmet covers. I'll see some helmets with bungee cords going all over the top of them and they're holding down. There's wires that are going to different places. Um, you got lights, like you've got the IR strobe light thing or whatever yep. it is on the top of your ballistic helmet there. There's also lights like this little admin light on the side. Like what? What what all is going on? Yeah, so um, let's probably rank things uh, as sort of like most important, and then we'll we'll work down to kind of or maybe least like important. most universally probably useful. I'm yeah. sure there's a lot of special case scenario things. So I, anytime we're shooting, we we really uh, should have ear protection in addition to eye protection. But generally speaking, like. Like, I'm going to wear eye protection that's independent of the helmet. So, you know, I'm going to wear glasses. But my ear protection, I have the option to uh, wear ear protection that's supported by the helmet. So, like, right here we've got um, OpsCore amps uh, set up with their uh, arm system uh, that allows me to mount the, the ear protection to the helmet. And I will tell you, like, this is a fairly new thing for me. I went for a very long time trying to stay away from having helmet-mounted um, ear pro just because i could you never just wore your ear pro underneath the helmet so a lot of times see. what i would really do is i would wear in the ear ear pro so i oh. had electronic in the ear ear pro either uh, stuff that was integrated into comms or um, just you know plain electronic ear pro that you know i could i didn't need to talk to anybody on a radio or anything mm -hmm. but it did offer me the benefit of um, amplification when i wasn't shooting and then reasonably decent protection when uh you know rounds were going off right now most of the time i was shooting outdoors and the uh the noise wasn't as quite as substantial as we get shooting indoors and so now that i shoot indoors almost exclusively i will wear plugs and muffs and to me if i'm going to be wearing uh, earmuffs or over the ear ear protection it is easier to have it mounted to the helmet than it is to try and put it under the helmet and then put my helmet on and fix the pads that can be done it is an option um, and in some instances i will do that but it's not as comfortable to me as a good system with the over the ear stuff mounted uh, to the helmet mm -hmm. now it's an added layer of expense and it's you know more stuff on the helmet 
That being said, um, it does actually offer you a little bit of extra stability because now you have like more points of contact where the helmet is touching your head. Oh, I didn't so, think about that. Uh, some people uh, will notice um, if they go from like running a helmet with out integrated ear protection um, and then they add on the ear protection that they have a little bit more stable platform uh, from that, you know, extra uh, point of contact That's an on each point. side. Yeah. And there, there is all manner of types. I mean, you have the Opscore ones. The, the amps uh, are, are very nice. They are more yep. expensive. Like over on our, our helmets that we use in a lot of classes, these bump helmets set up, like we got the Peltor Tactical 100 here. Not insanely expensive, but like a nice set of electronic ear pro that mounts right to the, to the helmet. And yeah, so yep. you, don't, you don't have to go insane with these, but I mean, yep. get something nice. And those offer, you know, a... a pretty solid value. Um, the attachment system is pretty solid. You know, it snaps into place mm -hmm. and, uh, will give you some of that extra, uh, you know, like a little bit more stable platform to them. Um, so I think like you do have to figure out a way that we can have ear protection and still maintain that good solid platform with our ear pro. Uh, if we try and cram a set of you know, over the ear, ear pro on our head, and we don't make any adjustments to the pad set, or we have a helmet that maybe isn't sized to have our ear pro on under the helmet, then we kind of run into some issues. Um, so we do need to think about, you know, specifically our, our ear pro. Um, and then eye pro should, should fit in there and not cause any, you know, major shift in the helmet. So, um, you know, that's something to consider. And then we get into some of the other stuff, right? So like, uh, I said I was going to go as probably most useful or or most important. And I think next when it comes to like doing specifically night vision stuff is just having a nice admin light totally, on your helmet. Totally so when it comes to like doing tasks, checking targets, things like that, this is the component that probably gets used the most, um, you know, after the actual night vision and the ear pro. Mm -hmm. um, I'm constantly using this little Princeton tech light to check targets or do tasks or, you know, run a shot timer if the uh, backlight turns off uh, and times out, that sort of thing. Um, so this is, uh, you know, it has a couple of different outputs. So I've got low, very low admin, you know, like red and blue light, and then I can press and hold and I get white light. Um, it also has an IR setting, so I can give a little bit of extra IR light in there. And, and that's a nice, like, you don't have to get, you know, this super expensive one. Most of our student helmets um, have a, a little bit more economical option on there. And it's just a nice thing to have yeah. um, so that I can, you know, augment and give a little bit of hands-free light. Uh, you know, whether it be in the vis spectrum or the IR spectrum. Yeah. We've said it before, night vision is close to magic. It's not full-on magic. And when you put night vision on, there are a lot of times where you're like, this is awesome. And then there's a lot of times where you're also like, this yeah. is a pain in the ass. <laughs> so well, usually when it comes down to like stuffing mags, writing something down, reading something, looking at a target, like you said, it, so many times you're like, I just want to flip this night vision up and just use yeah. my normal eyes. And in that case, if you got a little tiny light, then bingo. Uh, in that case, over there, you got your uh, you've got a uh, surefire light even mounted up on the side of your helmet. You know something like that. Yeah. Well, that one's even a little bit more. Uh, you, that'd be a little bright for some real close up admin stuff. Yeah. So I have an admin light on one side, and then I have a, a surefire vampire uh, light on the other. And so what this allows me to do is have either really bright white light or uh, quite a bit of IR light. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing stuff where I need a whole lot of light or I need to re reach out, um, I've got the ability to choose either a lot of light or a little bit of light. Yeah. And so um, this is a helmet set up for a little bit different different work than my you know range helmet. And um, this gives me the opportunity to, to see at distance without having to like point a gun at it. Um, or necessarily like hold a gun. So think, yeah. uh, you know, on like a ATV or something, I'd like to be able to like look around um, and scan uh, and have a, you know, potentially extra IR light source. Um, this allows me to do it off of, a, off of my helmet instead of having to hold on to something or, you know, point a gun at something. Makes sense. Um, so it's nice to have that. But 
I would definitely put this, you know, one step lower in priority versus this, because this is going to get one. used way more. This this low intensity, more admin uh, light is going to get way more use than uh, this guy that's, you know, kind of cranking out all the lumens. Agreed. Right. After that, you mentioned helmet covers. We can talk about that. So um, this uh, airframe has a helmet cover on. Those accomplish a couple of different tasks. So um, they do offer you a place to, you know, put different uh, stickers and patches and that sort of thing. And, and those aren't exclusively for, you know, just having, you know, 40 pieces of flare. Um, they, <laughs> they are useful. So um, these are, are passive uh, IR reflective, uh, you know, patches. So like if you shine light on two of them, uh, like let's say an IR illuminator, um, they will reflect back so that I know if I see that on somebody, um, first I, uh, you know, it, it cues me that, Hey, that might be a person as yeah. opposed to, you know, like an inanimate object or an animal. Um, and then it also tells me, depending on what the configuration of the stickers are, like, is that somebody that I know? Is that somebody that you know, is part of my, my group or maybe a different group, but it doesn't transmit any energy, right? Yeah. It's simply reflecting energy that, that is projected onto it. It's sort of like the night vision operators blaze orange. Basically. In some yep. Ways. Yep. Um, so it helps me to identify friend from foe. You know, so it's an IFF uh, tool and you can get them like we got an American flag here and then uh, just a plain, uh, you know, black, uh, a reflective uh, patch there. But you can get them with, you know, call signs and name tapes and that sort of thing. So this helmet has one that we had branded up with the Vortex Edge logo on it and you can get them you know custom made the other thing that helmet covers offer and you'll notice like this helmet doesn't have a helmet cover on it but it has uh, plenty of space for me to put patches on so that's kind of uh you know it's really common with the more modern setups that we have velcro already on them and then you can also put covers on they offer a little bit of protection to the helmet so it keeps them from being you know skinned up and abraded so that we don't open up and expose that ballistic material uh, to the weather or anything like that it also helps to break up um, some helmets if they're you know, finished in a certain manner can have a little bit of a sheen to them or they can develop a sheen to them over time um, as they wear in a little bit. And helmet covers uh, help to, you know, give you a little bit of texture. So um, it'll also, you know, some people, if you've looked around social media and that sort of thing, you'll get some that uh, they help to break up the outline of the helmet. So when we start talking about like the fundamentals of camouflage, um, a helmet cover can go a long way to helping you to break up the very uh, noticeable outline yeah, of the helmet. There's not very many really nicely rounded, smooth, shiny things yep. in nature. Yep. So helmet covers are, are nice for a lot of different things. Um, uh, the, you know, some people will make the most use out of them um, and you can help break up that outline you're you're breaking up the texture etc um, you're adding some pattern to it and it offers you a level of protection are the ones on here are these little bungees here so that you could put in things to either cable or things to break <coughs> up your outline maybe? yep so um, they they do offer you an opportunity to you know add uh, I guess vegetation um, or other things that would disrupt the pattern. But you did touch on a good point. If I have um, either comms cables from my ear pro or uh, a cable from my night vision to a battery pack, I can run it under there, and then I'm limiting snag hazards and that sort of thing. So um, I don't. I have historically not run um, helmet covers, and I'm starting to see more and more of the value to them, uh, and and like having having them. So um, mm -hmm. they are a a reasonably good uh, accessory to look at investing into. The um, so we touched on passive uh, identification. The other thing is active identification, and I put this kind of pretty low on the list right, of priorities. Uh, both of the helmets, uh, the ballistic helmets, the, the airframe, and then uh, this Team Wendy that I've got have um, active uh, identification markers. So this is a, a Hellstar, uh, and it's got a couple of modes in VIZ and a couple of modes in IR. Um, I don't think that's completely necessary for the majority of people that 
on the commercial side or civilian side uh, buy into helmets to get these. Um, they're they're cool to have and they can have some function, but honestly, most of them are so bright that they're intended to help like mark your location for an overhead asset, you know, like a, a helicopter or fixed wing asset. And people try to use them in groups like doing CQB or square range stuff. And they're honestly just too bright um, in most instances. And so to me, they have not a huge amount of um, utility. Uh, this other Hellstar model, I, I unfortunately don't remember the, the numbers associated with them, um, is dimmer. Uh, and I think a better choice, it's still pretty bright. Um, it's like you feel Clicked it on real quick to get yep. an example for the camera here. So there's the biz yeah, that's not, in, that's not setting. insanely bright. That's not too bad. <clears throat> so this is the, the viz setting, uh, the low viz setting, and then now you're talking the high viz setting oh, that's uh, on that one. So that one's, tag. that one's pretty bright. Um, and then... Uh, this has two more settings when I switch it over into uh, to IR mode. It's a similar level of brightness just in the IR spectrum. And so uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I, when people turn these on doing like square range stuff, they're bright enough that to me they're a little obnoxious. Now, if I was like on the other side of a range facility, you know, we're six, 700 yards away from each other and I can't make them out in the dark. And I'm like, Hey man, turn your beacon on so that I know where you're at. Like that's an appropriate amount of brightness. Right. Um, but I, I would really, I would say like something a little bit dimmer is better for like safety marking when we're doing square range stuff, just so that at a quick glance, I can make sure that like everybody's on the, the same line or, or, you know, nobody's down range or, you know, behind a target array or anything like that. I think something that's a little bit dimmer is, uh, you know, closer to like a chem light is a bit more beneficial, yeah. but it's still a decent tool to have on your helmet. Um, so that if you do need to signal to somebody, you have an option there, um, on your helmet, uh, that you can put to use and, you know, it, it, it looks good. I, I think, I think more people put them on their helmets uh, because they see other people that have them on there, and it's like, hey, my helmet's not complete unless I have that that tool on there. Right. Um, just understand that, like, uh, you're probably not going to be signaling to an aircraft or that sort of thing, uh, and so that level of brightness can be a, a bit dazzling to somebody looking uh, under nods that's on the range with you. So. Cool. Uh, it's just kind of like good etiquette. If you don't need that level of, you know, signaling, maybe use something uh, a little more tailored to the application, like a chem light. Hmm. I was going to say you have an Instagram, and I think you would know that 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 the cool factor. Yes. Yeah. Is, yeah. Right? Okay. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Good stuff. I mean, maybe we didn't hit on every single possible thing you could <clears throat> potentially put on a helmet. I don't know. Is there anything else that's like? Out there in importance, I feel like we've gone from important to more just sort of like, hey, maybe in a specific scenario. Uh, but that was, I feel like, a pretty good rundown on the helmet setup. It, yeah, what else? I, I think that's, um, I think those are the big things. Um, I'm honestly struggling to, you know, we have, we didn't touch on them specifically, but we talked about kind of all the stuff that goes on to them. Um, the accessory rails, you know, there's a variety of options out there. Um, that's a relatively new thing. Um, used to be you would buy helmets and they didn't come with accessory rails. You'd have yeah. to purchase them separately. And each kind of have their pros and cons. You know, some are Picatinny based. Um, some have more of a like manufacturer specific adapter system. Um, and then like the this is a, an Opscore style uh, that's on the the airframe um, that allows you to mount stuff to them. You know, the, I, I think we kind of take for granted that they're they're available on a lot of helmets now. Um, so if you're purchasing a helmet, you know, I, I would think about like how you're going to attach some of the accessories that we uh, talked about today. Um, and then, you know, just try and make the helmet as streamlined as possible. So like 
I like having the utility of this light here. I am purchasing a different light that tucks in a little bit more so that it's less of a snag hazard. You know, I'm always looking yeah. to like make the helmet more streamlined, get the same utility uh, with lower weight um, and ideally less cost, uh, you know, those sorts of things um, so that I don't have to have as much bulk or weight on my neck. Um, and yeah, just think kind of critically as to what stuff you're actually going to use and need on your helmet and what stuff is there just in case for that, you know, once in a, in a million opportunity to use it. Um, and can you use some other piece of gear to accomplish that task that you don't have to carry, you know, from the shoulders up sure. where the, the weight is most noticeable. Makes sense. Well, I like it. Hopefully that helps some people out there who are, are considering getting into night vision. This whole series is all for those people out there and figuring out your helmet setup. Certainly there is, uh, I don't know, we try, we, Mike mentioned some specific manufacturers in some cases, uh, things like that. I mean, we all have our own personal opinions, but if you have any questions about that, if you're shopping around, feel free to <coughs> hit us up on Instagram. Just shoot us a direct message or something like that at Vortex Edge. Uh, hit us up in the YouTube comments, and we can chat about that. Uh, we like all kinds of manufacturers here, but, uh, yeah, there's definitely some good ones, I'd say, that we've had really good experiences with. Yeah. Um, sweet. So with that being said, we'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. That's a wrap, everybody. Hope you liked this topic. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and of course, subscribe right here because there's going to be plenty more to come. If there's topics you'd like to hear us go over on the Vortex Edge podcast in the future, you can let us know by commenting below or hitting us up on Instagram, which is at Vortex Edge. We'd love to hear your suggestions so we can be bringing you the kind of episodes and topics that you want to hear. Otherwise, we'll be seeing you on a future episode. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Bye.